from the Brisbane Gazette. I'm not going to tell you which edition because then you'll read ahead. Well, there's a quiz. Okay. Which Australian state capital has the suburbs of Highgate, Mount Morley, Northbridge, Kensington and Osborne Park? Stay tuned. Motherhood plays an important role in the Bible. It binds the beginning and the end. These stories offer us a glimpse into the heart of God. And so we start at the beginning. Taken from the side of Adam, gifted with bringing forth life, the first woman was named Eve because she was the mother of all living. But she was also a mother in her own right, the first of many mothers to come. Though Sarah's womb was closed, God promised nations and kings would come from her. Ten years pass and motherhood seems as impossible as the day it was promised. But the Lord is faithful to keep his promises and Sarah bore a son who made her laugh. Leah was the firstborn, overlooked by her husband Jacob, who gave his heart to her younger sister. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. Despite Jacob's disdain, she found her motherhood in the Lord. When Pharaoh became angry at the fruitfulness of the Hebrews, Jochebed sacrificed her motherhood for the sake of her son. When Pharaoh's daughter saw the child, she had compassion on him. Because of Jochebed's sacrificial motherhood, the Israelites found freedom. Naomi was a mother who experienced the loss of her sons, yet she gained a daughter in Ruth who declared, for where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Naomi and Ruth became family by faith. Mary, a virgin and not yet married, was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. The motherhood of this blessed woman was more than the continuation of a family name, but a means for God to bring a savior into the world to save his people from their sins. From the garden to the cross, there have always been mothers. These women paved the way for all women, representing the full spectrum of the ways one could be called mom. Whether a mother in faith, mentorship, adoption, or by birth, you play an important role in the stories of generations to come. To all the Sarahs, Leahs, Jochebeds, and Naomis, Happy Mother's Day. During the week, when I was reflecting on this time communion, my thoughts simply went to, it's all about Jesus. Usually when I stand at the front, I will reflect on his amazing love for us, his mercy, his compassion, his forgiveness, and the freedom that we have when we enter a relationship with him. But this week, when I reflected on this time, that song came to mind. It was a song that I saw posted not long ago on Instagram, and it reminded me that it was all about Jesus. In a minute, I'm going to invite you to come to one of the four stations around the room. And for those that cannot go to those four stations, someone will serve you. And at, this, at these stations, we will reflect on Jesus. But before we do that, I'd just like to read Matthew 27, verse 32. As they were going out, they met a man from Serene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And there they offered Jesus wine to drink, with, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up the clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, 
one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it up in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let's say, I am the Son of God. Oh, let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults. Jesus loved us so much that he endured this. It's all about Jesus. Can I ask you to, if you are comfortable to move to one of the four stations in the room, to take a wine and bread, but please hold it as we're going to take it together. took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after the supper he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So um, this morning, I, I, I feel like um, the Lord is wanting to um, release the oil of joy into people's lives today. And so uh, just to... Uh, maybe uh, present ourselves to God as, uh, as we're just uh, sharing uh, a few scriptures uh, on, on this topic this morning, but uh, just to open ourselves and say, you know, Lord, uh, I want you to touch me today, to touch my life and uh, bring your presence into my life or renew my joy in a special way. So how about we just uh, pray and just uh, invite the Holy Spirit to move in our lives. Who comes to church to get touched and changed by God? So... Yeah, let's just, uh, just take a moment just to uh, still our hearts and minds before him and uh, invite him uh, to move in our lives this morning. So uh, you might want to just, um, you know, stand, sit, raise your hand, reach out, whatever is good for you, whatever works for you, but just to say to the Lord, you know, here I am, 
uh, come and touch me this morning. So, Father, we do, uh, Lord, as we've already sung, Lord, um, <clears throat> and uh, invited your presence into this place and into our lives, Lord. We would just ask you uh, to move upon us and among us, Lord, and release your presence and release your joy, uh, Lord, into lives today, we pray. And, uh, Lord, we, we would just reach out to you, Lord, as an indication, Father, that uh, we're open, we're receptive, and we're inviting you, Lord, to bring encouragement and change into our world. So, Lord, just come now and touch us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I was in a... Um, in a um, church service or a, some kind of evangelistic meeting uh, in, the, in the Philippines uh, in uh, the late 1980s. And there was this, there was this uh, gentleman there and he was just, um, you know, it's hard to describe this, but he was just like radiating joy, radiating joy. I don't know if you can imagine that, but it was like joy was shining out of his face and he was just standing there and uh, I was just standing beside him, and this guy was probably about 60 years old, and that would be, you know, back in the day when I thought 60 was old. Uh, I've now realised it's quite young, but um, <laughs> back then I probably thought this guy was old, but uh, he, was, he was standing there, and, he was talking, and I noticed that, you know, he had a, had a walking stick, and, um, and I, you know, I just asked him, you know, what was wrong, and it, it was just this weirdest thing happened, and uh, I try to explain this, but uh, he said to me, uh, with his face radiating with joy, oh, it's cancer, as if he'd just won the lotto, or, you know, he'd just got married. It was just, it, there was no um, retraction of this sort of overwhelming sense of joy that was radiating out of him. And the reason for this, uh, as I've, you know, as, as the scripture teaches, and we can look at this a little bit, is that joy is a characteristic of God's kingdom and God's presence. And, and the joy that Jesus gives is not simply rooted in circumstance. The joy that Jesus gives comes out of relationships. So you can be um, enduring trial and difficulties in your life, in um, day-to-day -day life, and still be filled with and empowered by the joy of the Lord. And in fact, uh, in um, the book of Nehemiah, uh, the, the, you know, the um, Israelites are going through some trials and reflections um, and a bit disappointed with their uh, performance, and uh, Nehemiah speaks to them and he says, uh, do not sorrow, for the joy of Yahweh is your strength. And so what we discover in Scripture is that joy that comes from God, joy that's a grace upon our lives, is actually strength for life. And, you know, sometimes when we're battling through difficulties in our life, you know, our joy can sort of fade away and, our, and our, um, the joy that, that um, you know, that does come from God and that he wants to provide to us, we can lose our sense of that joy uh, because, you know, we're wrestling with difficulties and issues in our life. And so this... this um, this experience of seeing this guy um, just standing there going, you know, I've got cancer and just radiating joy was sort of, was such an illustration to me that um, God's joy can sustain you in trials and in difficulties. And the joy that we have and the joy that we can treasure and boast about as believers is not simply related to circumstances. And, you know, many times, you know, in life, people are looking to, to get joy out of circumstance. You know, I'll have joy when I, you know, meet the right partner for my life. I'll have joy when I get a better house or a better car or, or, or you know, this, this issue at work gets resolved. And we're, we're looking basically at getting joy out of circumstances, which is fine. We do that. And we often get joy out of circumstances. But there's also this other um, deep and abiding joy that is a gift from God that we can uh, have in our life 
regardless of circumstances and uh, even in the face of adversity. So I had this um, experience of joy, supernatural joy, uh, the night that I got saved, uh, which was a few years ago now, (laughs) in uh, 1985. And... uh, I was in this house and with these two other Christians and they led me in this prayer uh, to, re- you know, relinquish my life to Jesus and say, you know, <clears throat> I've walked independently, I've lived independently of you and I'm surrendering my life to you and giving my life to you. And, uh, you know, when people do this, like, very different things happen, it's very individual so I'm not saying this is a pattern for anyone else, what happened to me, but when I prayed that prayer sitting on the floor in this lounge room, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit came upon me very, very strongly. It was like I was cocooned in God's love and filled with God's love. I could feel like this liquid love all around me and in me and through me and and I just sat there motionless, and I thought I sat there for two minutes or so, but the people there said, or the two people there that were praying with me, they said, oh, you were like completely still for 20 minutes, as you know, the presence of God was just there so strongly. And um, this friend of mine, he took me there, like he drove me home, and when I, when I got out of the car, I did this thing that I can't even try to demonstrate now, but you know the the Toyota ad, you know, oh, what a feeling, and the, you know, the, the, you know, the guy jumps to the air. I mean, I know the feeling because I've had my Corolla for 15 years and it's a great car, but, <laughs> um, but this night, like, I got out of this car and I, there was, like, this surge of joy, like, went through my whole being and, like, I jumped in the air and spun around and I found out later that the Hebrew word for rejoice actually means to jump in the air and, to, and spin, or well, that can be one of the interpretations of that word, no demonstration is coming. So, so, and I had this experience like this, of being like engulfed by this supernatural joy that comes from God. And I, like, it was like there was this shift in my emotions, you know, from being, you know, a bit um, sort of lost and didn't know what life was about and, uh, you know, 24 years old and, um, you know, depressed and discouraged and not really knowing what I was doing but thinking there's something I'm meant to be doing but I don't know what it is. And, like, God just touched me so powerfully and it was like this, this sense of being cocooned in joy, like, like it's, it went on for a long time, like, as in years. And um, it was very, a very powerful thing for me. And as I say, everyone has different experiences, but Jesus, uh, when, he, when he initiated his ministry, and uh, he, you may recall, he went into the synagogue in Nazareth, and they handed him uh, the scriptures to read, and he stood up, and uh, he made this declaration of what he was about, and he read out of the prophet Isaiah, and he, and he read these words, and I'm quoting actually from Isaiah here, but you'll find this in, uh, in the beginning of his ministry in the Gospels. The, the, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Jesus said, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And it says in the Gospels that then he closed the book and he handed back it back to the attendant and he sat down and he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your presence. So this is this declaration by Jesus that he has come to bring uh, healing and good news and liberty into the lives of people. And if we read in Isaiah, it goes on, Uh, And the passage that he quoted from, to console those who mourn in Zion, to console those who mourn, to give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning, 
the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So there is this antidote, if you like, for sorrow and mourning and grieving. And, 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 you know, that a sense of death or depression. And one of the things that Jesus does when he intervenes in people's lives is to release what the Scripture calls the oil of joy. The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And what we discover in the New Testament is that joy, joy is a characteristic of God's kingdom. And you know, some of that can be surprising because many of us have sort of grown up with the impression that church is about being serious. Who's ever thought that? Yeah? And the the idea that Jesus is about releasing joy into the lives of people, seems foreign to people who have like a very kind of religious mindset about Christianity and think it should be all very serious and staid. And, you know, that's, that's obviously a huge contrast that's drawn. But Jesus, as we've been looking at in the last couple of weeks in, in his teaching on prayer, so if his p- first principle in prayer is is, um, Father, let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. It's like this, it's like, it's invitational, but the, the language in Greek is also almost commanding. Kingdom of you come. Will of you be done. It could be translated like that, a bit clunky in English, but that's the kind of, way that Jesus taught us and encouraged us to pray. Paul says in Romans 14, 17, that the kingdom of God, this kingdom, this governance, this reign of God that uh, breaks into our world when we pray as a response to prayer, he says this, that the, the kingdom of God talking about different rules that people were caught up with, but the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So this is a definition that Paul gives of God's kingdom or God's reign, is that when God is reigning, when he is ruling, when, when, when uh, you know, we differentiate the idea of kingdom from church and say, you know, the church are people who can bring the kingdom, invite the kingdom, pray the kingdom, have the keys to the kingdom through prayer, that means that I can move, if you like, even as a Christian, I can move in and out of God's reign in the sense of my emotions or my character, like... Um, and stuff that's going on in my life. But when God is reigning, there is joy and peace and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. This is what Paul said. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. David put it a different way in Psalm 1611. You will show me the path of life In your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence is fullness of joy. This is a powerful statement, isn't it? That we can can come into God's presence as believers and find this fullness of joy regardless, regardless, of circumstances. There, 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 is, there is an opportunity to confront the trials and difficulties of life empowered by joy, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Isn't it good to know that you don't have to have a place for everything and everything in its place to have joy? Things can be, you can have upheaval in your world and have joy. 
and you can have everything organized and have no joy because joy is, is, is a characteristic of the kingdom. Now, Jesus, according to Hebrews chapter 1, was the most joyful person who ever lived. Verse 8 and 9, it says this, To the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. In verse 9, You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Or their New Living Translation says, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than on anyone else. So we get this idea in Scripture of joy being like oil, like a spiritual substance, if you like to think of that idea, that God can come and pour out the oil of joy over a person and they can receive the joy of God in their life through relationship with Him. This is, the, this is like the metaphor that the writer to Hebrews used to try to get us to understand that joy is something that God releases into our life, sort of like oil. And it, it builds on uh, this whole idea of anointing that came out of the Old Testament. For example, uh, when somebody was made a king, like, like Saul was made king by Samuel, and Samuel went with a horn of oil and he poured like probably half a litre or a litre of oil over Samuel's head, over, over Saul's head, Samuel did. And this oil, of course, would have run down all over through his hair and down in his clothes and he couldn't go down to 7-Eleven and buy some shampoo. Probably there would be this residue on his skin and his hair and his clothes for ages. But the oil represented something. It represented that God did something on the inside of Saul that gave him a capacity to be a leader. So, he, so he's, he receives this gift of grace to lead Israel that's, that's um, pictured by this anointing oil. And then when, when God's favour moves to, from Saul to David, um, <clears throat> Samuel goes then to David and he does the same thing. And the scripture says that the Spirit of God left Saul. And from that moment on, although it was some years till he came into the office of King David, had this leadership capacity that came from God uh, from that moment forward. So we, have, so, so we have this idea of anointing and different other people in the Old Testament were anointed. So therefore, these Hebrew readers understood this, that, that what God was saying by this is that joy was something that God imparted to Jesus. He anointed him with the oil of joy more than anyone else. I don't know if you ever think about it, but Jesus was a person who was filled with joy. Have you ever thought about that? Because, you know, you know we, we can often think in very serious terms about all stuff in Scripture, but the Scripture says that Jesus was a person who was filled with joy. Now, The scripture says this, how do, you, how do you respond to something if you don't really have in your mind that joy is a gift from God? And it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, rejoice always. Or in Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say rejoice. So, so basically saying in these uh, letters to believers like us, be, be joyful all the time. We say, well, how can I be joyful when I can't pay my bills, when my kids are playing up, when, you know, I've got all these arguments and stresses at work and, you know, da 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 da, da. And Paul's telling me to rejoice all the time. All the time. This, this is like to be my default emotion is Joy. So 
So how can we have joy in our daily life? That's a good question. Because joy is strength in life to face the circumstances of life. Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Well, Jesus said this, John 15, 11, we've, we've seen that he is the most joyful person, according to Hebrews chapter 1. These things I've spoken to you, he, Jesus says, that my joy, says Jesus, may remain in you and that your joy may be full. That Jesus is saying this to each of us, that my joy, says Jesus, not me, my joy may remain in you and your joy may be full. Remember, David said, in your presence there is fullness of joy. So Jesus is saying, hey, I'm giving you my joy. I'm releasing my joy into your life. Galatians 5.22, among other things, says the fruit of the Spirit is joy. That means it's like the consequence or the outworking of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life is joy. Not seriousness and depression, but joy. If the, if the presence of God, is, uh, of the Holy Spirit, is activated in my life, there's going to be this sense of joy. It might not be laughing and dancing all the time, but inside, there's this joy. There's this joy bubbling up, this joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. Peter talks about this and says, though now, 1 Peter 1, 8, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Or another translation, filled with a joy that cannot be explained. Or another translation, indescribable and glorious joy. Now, you can be filled with a joy that cannot be explained because it doesn't come from your circumstances. It comes from relationship with Him. So, just one thought before we pray. There is this idea in Scripture that God gives joy, that sometimes joy abates, and God restores it. In Joel, um, the trials that the nation was going through at that time, Joel 1.12 says, The vine is dried up and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree and the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. In Galatians, uh, the church is being, you know, tested by legalism. And they're sort of, they've sort of left their, uh, you know, freedom and liberty in the spirit and they're being pushed to sort of work out their Christianity by human effort, by obeying rules, instead of by depending on the presence and power of God. And Paul says to them in Galatians 4.15, what has happened to all of your joy? You're trying to do this all in your own strength and you've lost your joy, he says to that church. And so we can start to understand, you know, that even David, although he says in Psalm 16, in your presence there is fullness of joy. After he messes up in a big way in Psalm 51, he says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. So I'd just like us to pray this morning. You know, Jesus said to pray, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Which is inviting God to reign. It's saying, God, I want you to reign in my heart and in my life or whatever issue I'm praying, I'm praying about. 
And we've noticed this morning in different passages, passages that that kingdom is a kingdom of joy and the king of this kingdom is the most joyful person who ever walked the earth and he says, my joy I give you that, my joy may be, that your joy may be full. So why don't we just pray if, if, if God is touching you today and you would say, hey, I would love for the Father to fill me with this joy this morning. Maybe you've never experienced that joy from God or maybe you go, look, my joy is drained away <laughs> because of stuff that's been going on in my life. I've lost my joy and I want my joy restored this morning. Well, Jesus says, my joy I give you that your joy may be full. So um, maybe we could just lead a prayer and uh, before we have our closing song, but if you would say, Lord, I want you to fill me afresh or for the first time with your joy, maybe we'd just like to stand and we can just, uh, we can just pray a simple prayer together and just invite God to do that. So if you'd like to pray that prayer, just stand with me. I'm going to pray it. I want to be filled with his joy. Amen. So uh, let's just reach out to him in a way that's comfortable for you. What feels, what feels good for you just to be saying, God, here I am. Come and touch me. So I'll just pray a prayer phrase by phrase and you might want to repeat that after me if that works for you. <clears throat> Father, I come in Jesus' name. And I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your kingdom. Let your kingdom come and your will be done in my life. Release in me the joy that is part of your kingdom and a fruit of your Holy Spirit. Restore to me or give to me the joy of my salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I just pray for every person who has reached out from their heart to you today and pray this prayer. Lord, that you would release supernatural joy from your heart to theirs today in Jesus' name. Amen certainly be available if you'd like prayer uh, as we have this closing song uh please please feel free to come and love to pray with you if that's uh if that would work for you this morning
Uh, thanks for watching the online service. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, the answer to the quiz. And the answer is Perth. See ya.